This is a recording of Chapter 5, Biodiversity Populations. We will discuss how species interact with each other in their ecosystems and how populations of species cha can change over time as a result of these interactions. Let's start off with the discussion question. What type of competition issues arise in your household or your dorm room? Do you share a bathroom? Do you share food? Is there competition over certain food or electronics? What about other examples where people compete for resources such as parking, getting admitted into college, registration for classes, access to bathrooms? Have you experienced competition in any of these cases? Discuss the types of competition you experience in everyday life and how do you deal with competition in order to try to get what you want and what you need? Perhaps you get to school early to be able to find parking. Maybe you figure out the time that earlier classes end and people are going to their cars to leave and you can get to school around that time to make sure that you get a parking spot as soon as it opens. Maybe you start to shower at unpopular times to avoid competition for the shower in the morning, especially if you're in a dorm room where you're sharing a shower or if you live with your family and you may only have one shower for a few people. You adapt to taking showers at times that you don't have to compete with everyone else. So these are some examples to think about how you have competition for resources in your everyday life. There are five types of interactions between species that share limited resources. Examples of limited resources are food, water, shelter, and land. We have interspecific competition, predation, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. We will start with interspecific competition. This is the most common interaction between species. This occurs when two or more species interact to use the same limited resources in an ecosystem. When two species compete for the same resources, their niches overlap, and one species may become more efficient in getting the resources compared to another species. So natural selection can lead to some species adapting so they can avoid competition for resources. This can happen through resource partitioning. Species that compete for limited resources can evolve with specific traits that help them share resources by either using parts of the resources, using resources at different times or in different ways. So here we have an example of five species of wobbler birds that live in spruce forests of Maine. They have adapted to reduce their resource competition by feeding in different parts of the spruce trees. So the areas that each specific species feeds on in the spruce tree is highlighted in yellow. So this wobbler feeds on the outside perimeter of the trees. This one feeds on the middle and a little bit of the outside. This one only seems to feed on the very top of the tree and so on. So they are not really competing for resources. They're able to feed from the same tree by having an adaptation for different parts of the tree. So they can all feed happily together within the same tree and not really overlap in their feeding location. 
They also may be feeding on different insect species that live in different parts of the trees. So for people, we can also do resource partitioning. And an example might be sharing a pan of brownies. So when you have the brownies, some people love the crunchy edges, like here's the edge right there. And other people might only want the center of the brownie pan where you don't have any edges. I prefer no edges, but I know people who only like the edges. So that allows sharing because some people only want the middle, some people only want the edges. And then you have people who don't care and they love all brownies and they'll take any piece. So by having a variety of preferences among a group of people, it allows people to share and partition the brownies so everyone gets a piece that they like more easily. Then we have predation. Again, we're using this list. We're going down the list explaining each of these. So predation, that is when a member of one species feeds on a living organism as part of the food web. The species that is doing the eating is called a predator, and the organism that is being eaten is the prey. So you end up with these predator-prey relationships, such as a bear eating a salmon. Predators have a variety of methods to help them capture their prey. So herbivores can walk or swim or fly up to the plants that they're gonna eat, and then they eat the plants. So like a giraffe has an adaptation of a very long neck so that it could reach the leaves on trees. And other herbivores have different adaptations to allow them to eat plants. Carnivores feed on prey that are mobile, meaning they're moving around. So they have two main options for capturing their prey, pursuit and ambush, and cats do that. Also, some animals can run very fast in order to catch their prey. For example, a cheetah. And also young foxes play when they're little and they learn how to pursue and ambush. And I'll show you that video in a second. Um, carnivores, predators also have camouflage so that helps them hide and ambush. Spiders and some snakes use venom to paralyze their prey. So these are two young foxes and they are practicing ambushing. So this one is hiding in the grass a little bit and then it's gonna pounce on the other one. I do have the full link here if you wanna watch the rest of the video. And here is a cheetah that is running after its prey. And how could prey protect themselves from predators? You have camouflage like squirrels that match tree bark. They're pretty much the same color as the tree bark. Mobility, the ability to run, swim, or fly away. Highly developed senses of sight or smell alerting prey to the presence of predators. Physical protection, such as shells, thick bark, thorns, quills on porcupines, spines on hedgehogs. Chemicals, such as poisonous chemicals, like on dart frogs. Irritating foul smelling chemicals, like a skunk. Bad tasting chemicals chemicals used to hide, like an octopus or a squid having ink. 
Prey can mimic other species that may scare away potential predators, like a school of fish clumped together could look like a larger animal and trick predators into thinking that they're a larger animal. And prey can play dead. So here is a hedgehog with spines. Here's a school of fish that looks bigger. And sharks have bad eyesight, so this could easily trick a shark. And then here are some specific prey species with ways that they avoid predators. Here is a beetle that's squirting out a chemical. Monarch butterflies taste foul. And then you have this other type of butterfly that is pretending to be a monarch butterfly. It looks very similar. Here's a dart frog. This is a caterpillar, a snake caterpillar, that when touched, it can turn into what looks like the head of a snake. Here is a moth that looks like a set of eyes. This insect looks like a leaf. This worm looks like part of a branch. And then we have co-evolution of prey and predator species. So prey species can develop traits that make it more difficult to be caught by predators, while predators can adapt a better ability to catch the prey species. For example, bats use sonar to find moths at night while some moths have adapted the ability to sense the sound frequencies from the sonar that bats use to find them. And then they could avoid being eaten. Then we have parasitism. That is when one species, the parasite, feeds on the body of or the energy used by another organism, which would be called the host. Usually they do this by living on or living in the host. A parasite usually is much smaller than its host and rarely kills it. Parasites can live on the inside of the host like tapeworms or on the outside of the host like a mistletoe. This is a mistletoe attached to a silver birch tree. And here is a sea lamprey living on a trout, and the sea lamprey is a blood-sucking parasite. Mutualism is when two species behave in ways that benefit both by providing each other with food, shelter, or another resource. This is a type of symbiotic relationship, when two species live together and share a relationship usually related to feeding. Examples of mutualism include birds that ride on the backs of large animals and remove pests from them, like rhinoceros and African buffalo. And then the birds are then protected from predators. Also, the bacteria that live in our intestines help digest our food and they get nutrients from the process. So some people actually take probiotics, which are bacteria, such as acidophilus, and that helps with digestion. And you can find acidophilus in yogurt, for example. And these are ox peckers or tick birds that are feeding on this black rhino. And they eat parasitic ticks. And then they are protected from predators by being on the rhino. Another example of mutualism is clownfish living with sea anemone. So here is a clownfish, like in Finding Nemo. Nemo was a clownfish. 
So sea anemone have tentacles that sting and paralyze most organisms that touch them. But the clownfish is not harmed by the tentacles. And then they feed on the waste matter left from the sea anemone's meals. The sea anemones benefit because the clownfish protect them from some of their predators and parasites. So it's a nice mutualistic relationship between sea anemones and clownfish. Commensalism is an interaction that benefits one species but has little, if any, beneficial or harmful effect on the other. Epiphytes, not sure if it's pronounced epiphytes or epiphytes, but they are plants that attach themselves to the trunks or branches of large trees for access to sunlight. So the tree is not harmed, but the plant and the flower are then able to be closer to sunlight and survive nicely. Another example of commensalism is a zebra shark with a remora on top of it. And the remora is a fish that attaches itself to the zebra shark. And this allows the remora fish to travel to different areas without having to use its own energy to swim. And it also might eat parasites that might be on the shark. And the shark is not affected by this at all. So that is commensalism. And communities and ecosystems can change over time. And we call that ecological succession. Ecological succession is the gradual change in types and amounts of species in a given area. It is a form of natural restoration of an ecosystem. And there were two main types of ecological succession, primary ecological succession and secondary ecological succession. An example of restoration and ecological succession is forests in Australia that were affected by the bushfires in the summer of 2019 into 2020. So you had a lot of areas that suffered complete devastation from these bushfires. But there are plant species that evolved to regenerate after fire. Either they re-sprout or their seeds are released related to the fire. And they have the ability to start regrowing after a fire. So even though the bushfires in Australia were completely devastating in many areas, you do have regrowth of some of the plants. So you have some, for example, you have some eucalyptus that is regrowing and you do see some green in this photo. There's some green here. So there is going to be regrowth and regeneration. Primary ecological succession is when you have the gradual establishment of communities. When you start in a lifeless area, there is no soil in a primary ecological succession scenario, no soil. And that happens after glaciation or if a volcanic eruption forms new rock, like the lava, when it hardens, it becomes new rock. And then you have a bare earth area with nothing there. Or even parking lots. Parking lots are paved areas. There's no soil there. So over almost a thousand years, 
these plant communities developed in this diagram, starting with bare rock that was exposed during a retreating glacier on Isle Royale in Michigan in Northern Lake Superior. So you started with just bare rock and then you start to have lichens and mosses growing on the rock. And over time, the lichens and mosses start to break down a little bit of the rock and form thin layers of soil. And once you start to form thin layers of soil, then you're able to start to grow small herbs and shrubs. So those are your weeds. So you have weeds growing, and then that allows for further soil development. When the plants die, they decompose and add to the soil layer. And then you get more and more plants. You have this heath mat, shrubs that are a little bit larger, and then eventually you start to grow pine trees aspen, spruce, jack pine. These are small pine trees. And then you end up with larger trees like balsam fir, paper birch, white spruce, larger trees, and you have an increase in your soil development. And that is a more mature forest. So all the way to the right here, you see time goes on from left to right. All the way to the right is a more mature forest where all you began with was exposed rocks. So again, primary ecological succession starts with lifeless areas without soil. This type of regrowth of a mature ecosystem from the bare bedrock can take hundreds to thousands of years due to the need to first build up a soil layer that provides nutrients for plant life. You might be wondering what lichen is. Lichen is algae and fungus that live in a symbiotic relationship. Lichen and mosses are usually the first organisms to inhabit bare rock. And this is a photo of what lichen looks like. And over time, lichen can break down the upper layers of rock. And that starts off the soil layers. And this diagram shows how this works. So here you start with bare rock. You get some weathering that breaks up the rocks a little bit. And then you have, here's some mushrooms, some mosses, some lichens, and they start to live in the cracks in the rock. And they start to develop thin layers of soil. Then you have your small annual weeds. Annuals mean that they grow one year they are not perennials, which grow every year and stick around. These are one year only, these weeds. And then eventually, as you increase your soil layer, which is this brown layer in the diagrams, you as you increase your soil, you're able to get larger and larger plants like trees. And that's when you end up with a forest. This is only gonna happen in an area that's able to support a forest. Like in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you're not gonna end up with ecological succession giving you a forest. You don't have enough rain to support a forest. But in ecosystems where you had a forest initially, and then you had disturbed areas like glaciation, that removed everything and left you with bare rock. In a case like that, you can end up regenerating to a forest once again. Here's some lava that turned into volcanic rock once it hardened, and you can see some plants growing directly in the lava. Well, in the volcanic rocks from the lava. 
So what is secondary ecological succession? That is the regrowth of communities in areas that have soil, where prior ecosystems were disturbed, removed, or destroyed, but the soil remained. So this might be abandoned farmland, forests that had forest fires, like the Australian bushfires, or areas that got flooded, for example, after Superstorm Sandy. So because soil is present, new vegetation can grow within a few weeks. So you're skipping the lichen moss stage that is associated with the primary succession. So this diagram shows you secondary ecological succession of an abandoned farm in North Carolina. So you're skipping the beginning step and you go right into having weeds grow. And then you have, so you start with your annual weeds, then you get to perennial weeds and grasses. Those are plants that grow back every year. Then you have your shrubs and small pine trees. Then you have a young pine forest where you start to grow saplings of oak and hickory trees. And then eventually you end up with a mature oak and hickory forest. So in this case, the pine trees do not represent a mature late stage forest. The oak and hickory is the mature stage of the forest. And what is a pioneer species? A pioneer species is a species that tends to be the first to colonize an area of land where the habitat was damaged. For example, goldenrod. So you see goldenrod very often on the side of a highway. And that's because the areas on the side of a highway are disturbed. That's not the natural ecosystem of that land. You know, you had the cut down of forests or whatever ecosystem was there, and goldenrod is able to easily inhabit that disturbed area. So that is goldenrod. On the Livingston campus of Rutgers, there's the Kilmer Ecological Preserve, which shows early stages of secondary succession in a cleared field. Now, I want everyone to note that all wooded and forested areas of New Jersey are secondary succession ecosystems. There are no original forests left in New Jersey. All of the forests had been disturbed and regenerated. Here is another example of secondary succession. In the mid-1990s, 1,000 truckloads of orange peels and orange pump, pulp sorry, were purposely unloaded onto a barren pasture in Costa Rica in a national park. And then it, over time, turned into a lush forest. So this is the summary of the two types of ecological succession, primary and secondary. So primary, you start without soil, and it could take, 100, it could take hundreds to thousands of years due to the need to build up soil layers first in order to provide nutrients for plants to grow. Secondary ecological succession, the letter S for soil, secondary for soil, right? So secondary has soil, secondary soil. So because you're starting already having soil, this is a faster process than primary succession So now we could discuss how populations change over time.
remember that a population is a group of individuals of the same species. And most populations live in groups, such as packs of wolves, flocks of birds, schools of fish. The size of populations is the number of individuals in a population in a given time. And there are four variables that affect population size. The number of births, the number of deaths, immigration, and emigration. And populations can grow, shrink, or remain stable. Limiting factors are factors that can affect the number of individuals in a population. Limiting factors can be physical or chemical factors. And this can include light, like the amount of sunlight, water, nutrients, acidity, temperature, and land size. Like how much land do you have available for those organisms to live there? So what are the limiting factors in an area that is affected by a drought? The limiting factor would be water. Another example of limiting factors would be water temperature for trout. So you have a range of tolerance. So here the temperature would be low and here it is as high. And in the middle is the optimal range for the tolerance of trout. So that whatever that temperature is, that's where trout are the most well adapted and well suited for that temperature. So if you get too cold, you're in the zone of intolerance and you have no organisms. When you get a little bit warmer, you have a few organisms, but they might be stressed. And then all the way over here, when the temperature is too high, you have no organisms. And when the water gets a little bit cooler, you do have some organisms, some trout, but they might be stressed. And then you get into your optimal range where you have the most trout existing. You have your highest population numbers in the appropriate temperature for trout. Population density is population per unit area, and that can affect population size. So in a dense population, there are some factors they may lower population numbers and some that might raise population numbers. And these factors end up canceling each other out and can keep a population at a constant stable size. For example, parasites and diseases can spread more easily within a dense population, and this lowers your population numbers. So like in a city where you have a lot of people living, you might have diseases that spread more easily and you end up lowering your population. However, within a dense population, sexually reproducing individuals have an easier time finding mates, which then could end up raising the population numbers. This concept ignores organisms moving in or out of an area, which would change population numbers. So we're just looking at factors related to dense populations, parasites and diseases, lowering the population, but having it an easier time finding a mate can raise the population. And these cancel each other out and could lead to the population remaining a stable size. Populations cannot grow indefinitely in nature. And why not? 
This is because populations can run out of resources like food and water. Also, exposure to predators and infectious diseases can also be limiting factors. Environmental resistance is the combination of all factors that limit the growth of a population. So the amount of water available, the amount of food, nutrients, the av availability of land or how much space you have. This environmental resistance with all of these factors that limit population growth determines the biologic car carrying capacity of an area. That is the maximum population of a species that a habitat, a habitat can sustain. So, for example, an island might only be able to hold 300 of a particular species, and that's it. So that would be the biologic carrying capacity of that island, would be 300 of whatever species. Population growth can be shown on a graph of population size versus time. Population growth generally starts out slow, but then accelerates as population increases. And this gives you an exponential curve. So at the beginning of the time, you have very slow population size increase. Okay, the population is staying around the same number. And then at some point, the population growth rate increases. So you quickly increase your population size, and that keeps going. That is called exponential growth. And the shape of the curve looks like the letter J. So we call this a J curve. It looks like the letter J. But there were always limits to population growth in nature. So logistic growth occurs as a population becomes larger and it nears the carrying capacity of the environment. So organisms are going to run out of resources like food, water, and land. So at that point, exponential growth is no longer possible and the population growth rate slows. So instead of continuing with the J curve, we shift to a more stable number of the population and it becomes an S-shaped curve that we call a logistic growth curve. So this part down here shows you the exponential growth, but then as you hit the carrying capacity, of the environment, population size levels off around the carrying capacity number. So we get the letter S. The curve looks like a letter S. And here it shows, again, the exponential growth and then it levels off around the carrying capacity. And realistically, you have a little bit of ups and downs in your population number. And that is because changes in your limiting factors, like if there's a drought, if there's more rain, leading to more plant growth and more food available, during a drought, you may have less food available, and that might limit your population size. So like the dip in population size might be related to drought and less plant growth. And when the population size increases a little bit, it might be due to more rain and more plant growth with more food. But generally, you're stabilized around the carrying capacity. 
So these bumps, little bits of up and down is related to the environmental resistance, which we talked about up here. The combination of the factors that limit the growth of the population. And this is a comparison of the J curve and your S curve. And then your little bits of up and down here. So this is more realistic than this S curve, which keeps the number steady around the carrying capacity. This is a little more realistic that the population size will vacillate a little bit. Now, what is a population crash? A population crash is a sharp decline in population size. This can occur when a population uses up its resources and exceeds carrying capacity of the environment. And that exceeding of carrying capacity is called overshooting. So in this example, you are increasing exponentially. And for some reason, the population is able to overshoot the carrying capacity, and then the population crashes. And you get a drastic decrease in the population number. And this is actually the graph representing reindeer introduced onto St. Paul, which is a small island in the Bering Sea. So 26 reindeer, 24 of them being female, were introduced in 1910 to the island of St. Paul. The food there was plentiful because there were no other reindeer already eating the food, so you had a lot of plentiful food. So this graph tracks the initial exponential growth, because when animals first get to a new location, they tend to have exponential growth as resources are plentiful. That does not happen if you have animals get to a new place without resources that are plentiful. Okay, so the reindeer got to this new island that had plentiful sources, resources of food, for example, exponential growth. The population kept on growing without any checks to it. And eventually the island could no longer support this really large number of reindeer and the population crashed. And so by 1935, the exponential growth led to the herd of reindeer being 2,000. So the population crashed, and then you ended up with eight reindeer by 1950. So the carrying capacity of reindeer on this island was found to be about 100 reindeer, and that's marked by this orange line on the graph. So around 1915 is when they really exceeded the carrying capacity, approximately 1915. The, the population exceeded the carrying capacity and you went up way above the carrying capacity to 2000. Humans are not exempt from nature's population controls. For example, Ireland recorded about 1 million human deaths and 3 million emigrants associated with the 1845 potato crop destruction. And during the 14th century, the bubonic plague killed at least 25 million people in Europe. As of 2013, AIDS has killed more than 36 million people worldwide between 1981 and 2012.
That is the end of chapter five's lecture recording. Thank you for watching. Bye.